everyone. It's really good to see you all this morning. It's uh, first Sunday in the season of Easter, and just got to say, Hallelujah, He's risen. So, by way of announcements, uh, kind of don't have any right now. There's uh, for people that provide information for the newsletter, Teresa is looking to have those in by the 21st. And uh, you are also in, everyone invited to a tea on April 30th at two o'clock in the afternoon here at the church. And the purpose of the tea is to um, I, how shall I put this? <laughs> Habitat for Humanity. Um, it's a, a fundraiser for Habitat for Humanity, which is uh, in the process of getting all the paperwork and so forth produced so that they can start building down here in Columbia. It's a $4 million build, and uh, it, it's a great program. One of the reasons that we like it so much is the business of having decent housing is a very human need and uh, Habitat's one of those organizations that's really very effective about it. I have a couple of things coming up educationally that uh, on Wednesday I have invited uh, a local pastor by the name of Mark Chavez who uh, I've known since 2000 Mark was once upon a time an ELCA Lutheran pastor, and he was involved in the creation of the North American Lutheran Church, and they have a congregation that is not far from us. And we had one of our members leave here and join that congregation, and it's produced some questions like, what's that about, who are they, and so forth. And so I asked Mark if he would come and sit down and just tell us who they are and, and so forth. Uh, so that's on Wednesday. And then next Sunday, during the adult class, we have a representative from Water Street Mission that's gonna take the whole class and then do a temple talk in the worship service. Water Street is the premier uh, social outreach ministry here in Lancaster County and has been for 144 years, which I think is pretty amazing. And it's the place that we send people that uh, have nowhere to live, they don't have any food, etc. Water Street has the resources to help those people right away and in very responsible ways. So got some guests coming in to tell us things that we might not otherwise know. So those are the announcements, and uh, I invite you to stand and join in the beginning of our service, which will be a thanksgiving for baptism. So hallelujah, Christ is risen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, by whose hands we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams, Honor to you for waters that wash us clean, quench our thirst, and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Amen. 
satisfy the world's needs through this living water, where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment, where despair prevails, grant hope, where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reign forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Thine is the Glory, number 376. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Acts chapter 2 to 14 and chapter 22 to 32. After the Holy Spirit comes to the apostles on Pentecost, Peter preaches the gospel to the gathered crowd. He tells them that Jesus, who obediently went to his death, according to God's plan, was raised from the dead by God. Finally, he appeals the scripture and quoting Psalm 16 to show that Jesus is the Messiah. Through, though crucified, the risen Jesus is now enthroned. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders, and signs that God did through him among you, as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the Lord. But God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in his power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to haze, or your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. For seeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. To Jesus, God raised up, and all of that of us are witnesses. The word of the Lord. Psalm 16. Let us pray together. Psalm 16, responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my joy is in the godly that are in the land, upon those who are my noble among the people. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods, never take their name upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My bounty is in close and blessed land. Indeed, I have a rich inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me right after right. I have set the Lord always before me. Because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. For you will not. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The second reading comes in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. The epistle was written to encourage Christians experiencing hardships and suffering because of their faith in Christ. The letter opens by blessing God for the living hope we have through Christ's resurrection, even amid difficult circumstances and surroundings. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. You are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvations of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Gospel according to St. John in the 20th chapter. The risen Jesus appears to his disciples, offering them a benediction, a commission, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. But one of their number is missing, and his unbelief prompts another visit from the Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the marks of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name, the gospel of the Lord. Praise well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures today are 
The first section of the gospel is the evening of Easter. And if you can use your imagination a little bit to put yourself in the place of one of the apostles or one of the group of women that followed Jesus around or any of that entourage that traveled with him, and quite frankly, um, we don't really know who all's in that group because we get specific names mentioned, but there's others there. But if you put yourself in the place of a close follower of Jesus at the time, you are coming out of a, of a religious life, a spiritual life, in which the hope of the Messiah is a, is a critical hope. And you're living in a time in first century Israel, in the second temple period, where the people, a remnant, came back from the Babylonian captivity, but it was not the glorious thing that some of the prophets had described. It was much more humble. The people felt as if the exile wasn't really over yet, and that the things that they had hoped for had not come true. It was not really a golden age even in the one period of time after the Babylonian captivity up until the time we're talking about now where the people of Israel were in control of a significant part of the land with a Jewish government, the time of the Hasmoneans was pretty short-lived. A whole century is about the scope of it. And even then, they made the mistake of inviting the Republic of Rome to send some troops to help them drive their enemies out, and of course the Romans stayed. So it was a very conflicted period of time with when is this exile really going to come to an end? When is this glorious day of the Lord going to happen? And the people's responses were pretty varied. There were some who were associated with the Levitical priesthood, the tribe of Levi, that had responsibility for the actions at the temple, who said, well, forget all of that prophetic stuff. We're going to stick just with the first five books, and this is the religion, and this is what we do, and isn't it nice that I'm in charge? So they were happy with that. There were some that said, well, you know, practicality, the Romans are here, let's work with the Romans. And so you had this party of people in Israel that were sympathetic and uh, operating with the Romans. You had others that were associated with the Romans' puppet king, Herod, and they carved out a little niche for themselves. You had people that wanted to overthrow the whole lot and bring in the Davidic kingdom again, and uh, they had their little party of zealots and so forth. So you had this varied responses to a complicated situation, only making it more complicated. For the bulk of the people, they're just trying to eke out a living. But their hope was fixed on the God of their ancestors fulfilling his promises to the covenant. And the one that they really focused on was the promise of a descendant of David who would sit on David's throne and rule from Jerusalem, and it would be glorious. And so the hope of the Messiah was very much in their mind. And now you have this group of people who are following a carpenter of all people around who has some connection to the house of David, who is saying things and quoting scripture and doing things that are typically only associated with the hand of God. And he goes up to Jerusalem, runs afoul of the authorities up there, and they execute him, execute him to get him out of the way so that there's not a revolt at the Passover. There have been wannabe messiahs in their history uh, before Jesus, and there were those after Jesus, and it was just one more failed hopeful scheme. 
ran up against the power of the state and they crushed him like a bug. Game, set, match. He has some devoted followers, a couple of people actually in government, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who took a risk and they went and they got the body of Jesus and they took it to a tomb that Joseph owned and buried Jesus there following the customs of, of the day. Some of the women that traveled with Jesus to include his mother followed along and they knew where he was buried and it all went down with the Passover and Sabbath at the same time and Jesus was dead on Friday and buried before sundown and nobody could do anything be because of the feast of Passover and because it was Shabbat and so early on the first day of the week we're not sure how many. One account just names Mary from Magdala. Another one says Mary from Magdala and the other Mary. And small gathering of women anyway went to the tomb to finish the burial practice. And it was not what they expected. There had been a stone rolled across the entrance to the little cave that Jesus was buried in. And it was rolled back. There was a guard mount that had been put there to make sure that he stayed, the body stayed in the cave and the disciples didn't steal it away and make prophecies about he's alive. They wanted to make sure that he stayed dead. The seal was broken and the guards were either in a catatonic state or they'd run off. And so the women approached the grave very carefully very confused situation. They saw a couple of things and they went back into the city to the upper room and told the gathering of the apostles and disciples, we've seen the Lord. Now, your imagination, you saw him dead. Do people raise from the dead? No, just because it was a long time ago didn't mean they didn't know what dead was, especially when the Romans got done with you. So two of them, Peter and John, went to the tomb quickly to find out what was going on. I think John's pretty much younger than Peter and got there first, and he got to the entrance of the tomb, and he looked in. Peter, being Peter, got there and went straight into the cave. John followed him in, and they saw. They had these slabs that they put the bodies on, and after a year when all the soft tissues decomposed, they put the bones in a box called an ossuary. So the body of Jesus, with the shroud over him, should have been laying there on one of the slabs, the linen is still there, but the body's gone. What do you make of that? They go back to the upper room. Somewhere in that time, Mary from Magdala runs into a man and says, where is his body? If you've taken it away, just tell me where you put him and I'll, I'll go get it. And the man speaks to her, Mary. And she recognizes the voice and recognizes the man, and she calls him Rabboni, my teacher. And he says, don't cling to me. So they've got these reports from women early, confirmed that the body's gone by Peter and John. Meanwhile, the disciples are kind of breaking up. A couple of them were headed home to Emmaus. While they're walking home, and we'll read this story in a couple of weeks, this man comes along and they get into a conversation walking down the road. You walk at two and a half miles an hour. It's a seven-mile trip. And they start talking about current events. And Clopas says to the stranger, we'd hoped that this Jesus was the Messiah. 
And the man says to him, you are really foolish. Did you not know that the Messiah had to come and suffer and die and on the third day rise? And then as they're walking along, this stranger starts a Bible study, and he starts with Moses, and he goes through all of the prophets, telling them about the Messiah. So they get to their house in Emmaus, a very small little village, and Clopas and the other disciple, who I think is his wife, invite the guy to stay overnight and get on his way in the morning. He agrees. And at dinner, they say, will you say grace? And so he says, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu, and he tears the bread, and as he's breaking the bread, they suddenly recognize it's Jesus. He disappears. They immediately go back to Jerusalem. Are you in good enough shape to walk 14 miles in one afternoon and evening? <laughs> Not me. I'd have slept for a couple of days and then gone back. But when they got back, they found out that the Lord's already been there. And that's what our first half of the gospel lesson was. Jesus came into the room, even though the doors were locked. And he said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. And they're like freaking out because they know who he is and they can't believe it because he's supposed to be dead. Can you picture this and how you would feel? Dead, buried, now he's standing in the room with you. So Jesus does a couple of things. He says to them, I want to make sure I get this right, Peace be with you, as the Father sent me. So he has taught them very carefully for an extended period of time about the Messiah and being sent, and so they know all these things. And so he reminds them, as the Father sent me on this mission, I'm sending you. If you are a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, first of all, you've got to come to terms with his being dead and bodily raised to life again. The resurrection validates everything that Jesus said and did. It's how you know who he is. And you put your trust in that. As his follower, you go where he goes. You do what he does. We call him Lord. And Lord is not just a nice, you know, like Mr. or Mrs. kind of title. It means the one I listen to. The one that I obey the one that is in charge of the decisions that I make that make up my life. Okay? Think of dictator, boss, the one with whom you have to do to the exclusion of everybody else. We don't like the word master, but it conveys the relationship and the authority of what it means to be Lord. Resurrection validates Jesus of Nazareth as Lord. And he says, just like I was sent all the way to the cross, I'm sending you. Matthew will phrase what Jesus says as, as you go, which is cast in a tense that it's happening right now, and then it's going to happen again, and then again, and again, and again, indefinitely into the future. As you go, you're sent, once again, Matthew, to be a witness to who Jesus is, to a world that is literally lost. 
Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. We live in a country that has lost its way and it has become completely alienated from truth. The great English journalist who became a Christian late in life, G.K. Chesterton says that when people stop believing in God, stop putting their trust in the Lord God, it's not that they don't believe anything, it's that they'll believe anything. And that describes our age. We are sent into that world as disciples of Jesus who bear witness to the good news that our Creator is a loving Father who sent Jesus into the world to save us, to give us hope, to give us an inheritance, and that you will find life in this risen from the dead Jesus. We are supposed to be the witnesses of that. Now, just like in Matthew, in John, you get the same thing. You're not sent out there on your own strength. You are sent as one who is given the very Holy Spirit of God. And in this story, Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And he exhales his breath on everyone in the room. The Spirit of the Lord God is now in the disciple of Jesus. So that as you're going, as you're being this witness, you have profound, unbreakable connection with God himself. You're not on your own. You're not alone. You're not without hope or strength. He ties up the bearing witness with the business of forgiving sins or not. We'll talk about that later, but it has to do with the very nature of the gospel itself. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. They were shocked and appalled. <laughs> and he says to them, Peace be with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came for us. St. Paul says that while we were your enemies, you died for us. We all recognize that wonderful parable about the sheep lost, in, the lamb or whatever lost in the wilderness, and you went to find and restore. And we know that that's a story about us. Lord Jesus, we pray that we can come to truly believe in your resurrection and have hope in the inheritance that you give. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, that we might truly be your faithful disciples. We ask it that your name might be lifted up and glorified in the world and that your Father's kingdom come. Amen.
We confess our faith together with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, thank you for your great love for us and for hearing your people when we pray. God, our rebirth, the good news of your resurrection brings refreshment to a weary world that you empower us to boldly share your radical love through our words and our words. As you breathe your spirit into the disciples, breathe your spirit of healing upon all creation. Nourish the earth with sufficient rains. That your strength helps us to counter the effects of pollution and destruction. You prepare the disciples for their ministry by calming their fears and granting them your peace. Equip our community's leaders. That you would guide them with a spirit of peace and hearts that burn for justice, that their leadership reflects your love. You come among us in unexpected ways. We pray for all who are poor in spirit, for the sick and those in need, especially. Mason, Ella, Patty, Brenda and Larry, Connie, George Podesso, Grisel Lopez, Gloria, Nancy, Donnie, Dawn, Georgian, Greg, Jim and Jenny, George and Kathy, Mary Ruth, Sandy, Tom, Randy, Gianni, Jessica, Julian, Brooke, Alex, Glenn and Carol, Bobby, Kathy. That you would heal and deliver them from their distress. As you met the disciples on the road to Mass, show us your presence along our journeys. Bless our doubts and questions. That you provide trusting and safe relationships for all ages to nurture our connection to you and one another. Resurrecting God, you bring us to new life every day. Thank you for blessing us with companions on our faith journey. That we may be faithful ministers of the gospel and strengthen us with the eternal peace of your promises. Let us now pray for our own needs, the needs of others, and give thanks for the blessings of this life, either silently or aloud. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift up our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Let us pray. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth and the breaking of the bread reveal us to the risen one and the pouring of the wine pour us out in the service of the world through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come and know Christ, broken and poured out for you. Please stand. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive the benediction. May our gracious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.